You're listening to an Axe Church sermon. If you haven't heard of Axe Church before, we are a church in Camas, Washington. You can check us out at axecamas.org. You can see what we're about and what we're up to. We're glad you're listening today and hope you enjoy this sermon. Last week, if you remember, we studied about self-control. And we studied about self-control because before that, we had talked about Felix, if you remember. Felix and Paul. Paul goes to a trial before Felix. The Jews accuse Paul. He gets moved to Caesarea before the governor, Felix. And there's, and there's all this uh, accusation that's coming against Paul. And so they have kind of a trial there. And uh, remember, Paul had sort of escaped these guys who wanted to kill him. Uh, and so we were going to lie in wait and kill him. So he's kind of safe, but he's still in trouble and he's arrested. And they have this trial. And after this trial, um, Felix doesn't make a decision. But instead, he sort of talks to Paul, and Paul talks to him about a few things. If you recall, he talks to him about self control that we talked about last week. And a couple of weeks before that, we talked about righteousness, right, and the coming judgment. And so those were the things that Paul talked about Felix about. And Felix was scared. He was scared. And he didn't uh, respond in faith to Christ. Instead, he responded in fear. And so that's the last couple of messages that we've had, the last couple of studies that we've had. And, and then we saw at the end of chapter 24 that Felix was ousted. Okay? He was, he was taken away. He did not do a good job. He allowed some bad things to happen. And they got rid of him. And then we had a new person come in named Portius Festus. A Festus for the rest of us, right? Um, it's like three Seinfeld fans. All right, fine. I'll do better. Um, Portius Festus comes in, and, and Portius Festus comes in uh, to be the, kind of the governor of the same area that Felix was. And Paul is still in jail. He's still under arrest. Two years he's been sitting there when Festus comes in. Okay? And so this is AD 59. 59 AD. We know that because we know when Portius Festus came in, so this is one of the places where we can date very accurately where this history comes from. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to chapter 25, we're going to try to get through a lot of Scripture today. Now, before I do that, I want to tell you about uh, just a little story about my friend Willie Roach, which if he watches this on video, he's going to be mad that I call him Willie um, because he's a judge now, and he goes by Will, the Honorable Will Roach. But by, for me, he goes by Willie, and so deal with it, Willie. Um, Willie Roach and I were in law school together, and Willie used to pick me up every day before school because I was too cheap to drive, um, and he lived kind of near me. And so he'd come in, he'd get me, and we'd drive over to law school together. And at the time, there was a Newsboys song out um, that, that had some words in it that said, Come, O Lord, and fill up my life with a lot of your presence. This is my heart's desire. Father, come and let your spirit abide. I long for your presence. This is my heart's desire. Now, as that song would play, and it was, it was new at the time, um, but we would blast the music, turn, you know, take the windows down. It was cold in Virginia in the winter and whatever, but we'd, the windows would be down, and Willie and I would just be pouring our hearts out. Just at the top of our lungs, we'd be singing to the Lord, asking the Lord's Spirit to come, asking him to abide with us and to fill my life. I had actually only recently fully come back to the Lord at that time in my life. I had walked away and, and found nothing but sin, darkness, death in that. And I come back to the Lord, and I was so excited about the forgiveness that he had given me, and I was, just, I was amazed by it. So we would just, like crazy people were just yelling. We're just yelling out the car, and the feeling that would overcome us of just joy, you know, I mean, it's fun to sing loud, regardless of what you're singing sometimes in the car, right? But this is something different. It was something different in kind. There was, there was an internal feeling of joy. There was an internal feeling of connection with the Lord that was something special and that you can't really explain. And, and why is that? What is it about the life of a believer where moments like that can happen? What is the thing that's different about life in Christ? Because when I'm not walking, when I was not walking with Christ, those moments didn't happen. But life in Christ, I had those moments. It's not because everything in my life was so great. Things were okay, right? But they weren't so great. It was just this incredible feeling. It was this incredible understanding as I asked for the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so, so why is it that those moments are possible for the believer? I want to talk about that a little bit today. Why do we get to experience that kind of joy? Unspeakable, indescribable joy. And so something Paul says here in the scripture we're going to study today clues us in as to what's happened to make that possible. 
And so we're going to get through a lot, or Lord willing, we're going to try to get through a lot of Scripture. And I'm going to move kind of quick. We're going to try to go through two full chapters here, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about that part of things I just talked about. So if you are in chapter 25, we're going to start at verse 1. It says this, Now when Festus had come to the province, after three days he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. So he's coming to Caesarea. He's taking over Felix. Felix, we don't know where he's from. We actually have very little historical evidence about Portius Festus's early life. We do know that he was in Caesarea at this time, but before that, we don't really know where he came from, but he came in. And of course, one of the first things he wants to do, because he's reigning as governor over this region of Judea, he needs to go see the leaders of the Jews, right? He needs to get in with them because one of the problems in this region, as we've talked about, is there's all this revolt, Right, these people who are not happy with Rome, and there's always this threat of sedition and revolt. So, of course, the best thing for this guy as he's coming in as a new governor is to go meet the Jewish people. So he does. After a few days, he goes to Jerusalem. Then the high priest and the chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul, and they petitioned him, asking a favor against him that he would summon him to Jerusalem while they lay in ambush along the road to kill him. So first, we see that the, that the leaders of the Jewish people, two years later, are still so worked up about Paul that when the governor comes, that's what they want to talk about. They still want to talk about Paul. That's how upset they are. That's how angry and against the message of Jesus Christ they are. But they're still thinking about Paul. And not only that, they're still trying to ambush and kill him like they were the last time. Two years later, I don't know if it's these 40 guys, remember they had said, we take a vow, we won't eat or drink anything until we kill Paul. Well, they can't still be alive if they kept their vow, right? Because it's been two years. And I can tell you, I can't go two minutes without having something, right? And so there's no way that those guys are still alive, but we don't know who this is exactly who's waiting to ambush and kill him. But apparently the chief priests are in on this and they're saying, bring Paul from Caesarea back to Jerusalem where we can try him. And of course, their intent is to kill him on the way. All right. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself was going there shortly. Therefore, he said, let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there is any fault in him. So he's inviting them. He's saying, no, I'm not going to take him here to Jerusalem. He's got to stay in Caesarea. Of course, that would have been the Roman law. To, to move Paul, a Roman citizen, back to Jerusalem would have made no sense. Um, and so he needed to be tried in Caesarea. But he says, go ahead and come with me and you can accuse him there. And when he had remained among them more than 10 days, he went down to Caesarea. And the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, he commanded Paul to be brought. When he had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. While he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I offended in anything at all. So, by his answer, we can tell that basically what the Jews are accusing Paul of is sedition, right? That Paul is causing trouble, right? The kind of trouble that would cause riots, uprisings, sedition. That Paul was against Rome somehow. Because they know that if they really want this guy, Festus, to do anything about Paul, they've got to make it, they've got to make it hit home for him. And of course, he's going to be very concerned about sedition. So that's the type of thing that it sounds like they're accusing him because Paul's saying, I haven't done anything against Rome. I haven't done anything against Rome. So the suggestion is that they've accused him of that. You remember, if you've been with us, what they accused him of originally, right? That he's causing trouble all over the Jewish world. That he's, that he's causing, you know, riots. He's causing difficulties. He's just been, he's been a plague, right? He's been difficult, and they accused him of profaning the temple that he had brought in to the intercourse of the temple, a Gentile, which he had not done, which he had not done. Of course, they were not able to prove these things. They didn't have any witnesses. It's pretty clear here that their case was weak. But according to verse 9, Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? So Festus still wants to get in the good graces of these Jewish leaders, even though he can tell as we saw here in the scripture, that the things that they're saying can't be proven. So to do a favor for them, he's saying to Paul, Paul, are you willing to go to Jerusalem and be tried? Which seems kind of weird. It's like they just tell him what he has to do, right? Except that as a Roman citizen, Paul would have had the right not to have to go back to Jerusalem to be tried, but to be tried rather there in Caesarea, okay? So that's what they said. So Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews, I have done no wrong as you very well know. For if I'm an offender or I've committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But if there's nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. 
I appeal to Caesar. All right. So Paul is saying, no, I'm not going back to Jerusalem. He's not dumb. He knows. Remember, he was the one who his, his nephew had told him they tried to kill him last time. He's not dumb. He knows if they're still upset about this, it ain't going to go away. And so they're probably going to try to kill him this time, which he knows not only would be bad for him, but it would also be bad for whatever Roman soldiers were escorting him who might get hurt or killed also, which is going to cause a huge, huge problem and going to cause big, big uh, you know, battles between the Romans and the Jews, which he doesn't want that either. So it's not even only just for himself. But he is smart enough to know, I don't want to go back to Jerusalem. So he says, I appeal to Caesar. Now, this is Paul's right. He has the right to appeal to Caesar. And if it's not unreasonable... Portius Festus basically has to grant it to him, okay? Now, I don't know why he didn't do this earlier. Maybe he realizes, okay, you know, Felix didn't let me out, but maybe this next guy will. He sees the guy's not going to, that he's kind of placating the Jews. And so he goes and says, all right, I go to Caesar. And we won't, don't forget that Jesus had told Paul, he had told Paul that he would bear witness at Rome. So Paul knows he's got to go to Rome one way or the other. Apparently now he knows he's going to go in chains, Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, You have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. All right. And after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to preach Festus. Okay. King Agrippa. You may remember from, we've been talking about Herods and Agrippas and whatever for a long time in the book of Acts. This King Agrippa is the grandson of Herod the Great and the son of King Agrippa I, who, if you'll remember back that far, was eaten by worms and died, okay? He, he, the people started worshiping him as a god, and he didn't tell them to stop doing that, even though he knew better. And God was like, okay, dead, and he died, okay? That was this guy's dad. Now, this is some years later, and he's now a king, and Bernice is not his wife, but his sister that has come with him, and they've come to greet uh, Festus, because, of course, Festus is the new governor to the area, and King Agrippa is like this client king who's in charge of some of these areas, not actually Judea, but some parts of the area around there. And so he comes and wants to make buddies, as these, as these you know, wealthy uh, leaders would have done at the time. Okay, so that's why they're there. When they had been there for many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a certain man left a prisoner by Felix, about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem, asking for a judgment against him. To them I answered, It is not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accused meets the accusers face to face and has opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him. Therefore, when they had come together without any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. When the accuser stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such things as I supposed, but had some questions against him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died, who Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters. But when Paul appealed to be reserved for the decision of Augustus, that's Caesar, that's just a name uh, that, that gives honor to Caesar, the decision of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. Okay, what's going on here? First of all, you've got to understand something about Agrippa. Because Agrippa is from this region, um, uh, you know, from Jerusalem and so on, he is very aware of the Jewish customs, laws, and so on, traditions. Not only that, Agrippa has actually been given the right to name the high priest in, in Israel. So he, so he is not unaware of these things. So when Festus is talking to Agrippa, it's because he doesn't know what to do with Paul. He doesn't know what to make of all this. Festus is clearly unfamiliar with Judaism, with Christianity. I'm not sure what part of the Roman Empire he's from, but he's confused by this. And of course, Agrippa knows lots about this. And then you see him saying, look, paul they're talking about some person, Jesus, who, who they say died, and Paul says he's alive. You know, once again, he, clearly one of the things he's taken away is the centrality of the gospel message that Jesus has risen from the dead. And he's, of course, confused about that, right? People don't rise from the dead. And so he's confused about that. He brings it to Festus and Festus, I'm sorry, to Agrippa. And Agrippa says, I would like to hear him. I'd like to see what this guy has to say. Okay, you get to hear him tomorrow, he says. So the next day, when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp 
and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city at Festus' command, Paul was brought in. This is interesting. Not only does he have Agrippa and Bernice come in to see Paul, he actually brings all of these other people in the city. So this would have been um, people that were the same rank. If you remember the commander of the garrison at Jerusalem, there would have been a couple guys like that that were of that rank, and then some of sort of the leading prominent men of the city, he brings them all around, which is interesting because if you remember in the book of Luke, Jesus says this, he says, but before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. So the Lord's prophecy here is coming true as Paul is before kings, the king, the ruler, the governor, and all of these other prominent people, and he's going to get an opportunity to talk about Jesus in front of all these people. It's an opportunity to witness, to give his testimony. And so that's where we are. And Festus said, King Agrippa, and all the men who are here present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore, I have brought him out before you and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not specify not to specify the charges against him. So he's literally so confused about why Paul is there that he doesn't even have anything to write to Caesar as he sends him there for appeal. Right? So Paul would just show up and he'd be like, what are you in trouble for? Nothing. All right, all right, go ahead. Right? He has nothing to write. And so he's actually having Paul, part of what he's doing here, part of what Festus is doing, is having Paul come out and talk before Agrippa so that Agrippa can give him some idea of what's going on so he knows what to write when the guy goes to Caesar. All right, so then Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. You know Paul likes that. When Paul gets told he can speak, he's generally going to comply. So we're in chapter 26 now. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. So he's saying, listen, finally... I've got somebody in here who isn't one of the Jewish Sanhedrin type leaders, but understands Jewish law, has some expertise in what's going on, and you're actually going to get to hear me so that somebody can make sense of what I'm about to say. I'm actually happy to be before you for that purpose, Agrippa. That's what Paul is saying. He says, my manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know, they knew me from the first if they were willing to testify, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand in them judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise, the 12 tribes earnestly serving God night and day hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? So here's where he's starting out. He's saying, hey, listen, Agrippa, I'm a Jew, old school styles with a Z, right? I am a Jew. I'm a Pharisee, the strictest sect of Jews. And so I'm not coming from some weird place. This isn't some strange cult. I'm a Jew. I'm still a Jew. And it's actually for the hope of the Jews that they are persecuting me. And here's where, here's where things get turned around for somebody like Agrippa or for somebody like the Jews in the Sanhedrin. The hope of the Jews they thought was in somebody else a Messiah to come, of course, a Messiah, the one that they wanted, a warrior Messiah, a Messiah with lots of big swords who was going to cut up all the Romans and give them prominence and so on. But Paul's saying, no, 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 no. That's not what the hope was about. The hope is all in Jesus. It's simply a matter of interpretation, Agrippa. These people, you know the Old Testament, King Agrippa, right? These people are saying that, that our hope is in this thing over here. They don't understand it. And I'm saying our hope has come, lived, died, and risen again. That's what Paul is saying to Agrippa. And he's saying, why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Because, of course, the Pharisees and many of the Jews were looking forward to a resurrection. 
right? To rise from the dead. That's what they were looking forward to. So we're saying, why would, why would it be so crazy that, that Jesus would have risen somebody, brought somebody back from the dead, or that God would have brought Jesus back from the dead? All right. Indeed, I myself thought, I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So Paul, this is the second part of his argument. He's saying, okay, I'm a Jew, the real deal Jew, old school styles. Second when I first heard about Jesus of Nazareth, I thought I needed to be against it. Just like these guys who are accusing me, I was just like them. And I was better than them at it. I was fervent, right? I was chasing people down. When people were being put to death, I was assenting to that. If you remember when Stephen was stoned, Paul was the one sitting there as people were putting coats at his feet, right? As he was standing there as witnessing, saying, yes, I assent to killing Stephen, who was the first martyr of the church, Stephen the deacon. Okay? So Paul was, was willing to see people dead, tortured, put in prison. It says that he tried to get people to blaspheme. He tried to get people to deny Jesus by threats, by force. He was chasing people from synagogue to synagogue, from city to city. He was very zealous, very zealous for that old school vision of what the hope was until something happened. While thus occupied, in other words, as I went from city to city to persecute these Christians, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. Now, we're going to get the third time that we see Paul explaining to someone what happened to him when he was confronted with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. So let's walk through his story. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, I've talked before about what the goads are. If, you, if you're in agriculture um, and maybe you have some oxen or something, you may know what a goat is. Okay, a goat is like a pointy stick, right? And you want the oxen who are in their yoke to pull things and keep moving and go the right direction or whatever, so you've got a pointy stick. It's really helpful for that. Poke, poke, pointy stick, right? And what happens is, as you can imagine, when you're getting poke, poke, sometimes you kick, right? And maybe you kick right into that pointy stick. Either way, you find out that kicking against that goad is not very helpful. You're stuck. You're in a yoke. You're going to do what the farmer wants you to do. It is a waste of your time, effort, and energy to kick against the goads. And Jesus is saying that to Paul. Paul, listen, you can't stop. You cannot stop me. You cannot stop what I'm doing. You cannot stop the life that I'm bringing, the light that I'm bringing into darkness. It cannot be stopped by you. And every time you try, as you go and you chase these people down and you do all these things, you're just kicking against the goads. But you're going to go where I want you to go. That's what he's saying. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. So Jesus is saying, listen, you know, Jesus had his ministry, and then he went back and the Holy Spirit came. So that believers could, in the power of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, continue that ministry with Jesus' authority. Here he's giving Paul that authority, saying, I'm going to send you to the Jews, to the Gentiles, to minister, to continue the ministry that I started, to see the kingdom continue to spread. And he says this, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, and, from the, uh, and that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's a powerful verse. We're actually going to come back to that verse. But this is a description of, of Christ's kingdom. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But that's what he's saying he's sending Paul to do, to proclaim this. The forgiveness of sins, right? Therefore, King Agrippa, Paul's talking again, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Duh, right? You don't be disobedient when Jesus comes and tells you to do something but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent 
turn to God and do works befitting repentance. So he's saying, look, I follow what Jesus told me to do. I went, I preached this. I preached the kingdom, the coming kingdom of God. I preached about turning from light to darkness, from the power of Satan to God. I preached about the forgiveness of sins that was offered, and I encouraged people, I exhorted people to repent, which is to turn from the way that they were going so that they could be going in the right direction. That's what I did. It says, for these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. It was for that. It was for me following what Jesus told me to do that I'm standing here, that I was seized by the Jews in the temple. Therefore, having obtained help from God to this day, I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. So he's saying, listen, God has kept me okay, which is a pretty significant thing. Because we know how badly these Jews, the leaders of the Jewish nation, wanted Paul dead. And somehow he's still living. And that's what he's saying. Hey, I'm still alive and living. God has protected me. I've talked to both small and all y'all. Right? You rich people, you rulers who are all stuck. I'm still talking. You might notice something about what God's been doing here. Everybody wants me dead, yet here I am continuing to proclaim the name of Jesus. And all I'm saying is what you know, Agrippa, what you know that's in the prophets, what's in Moses, what's in the the Old Testament, it's all talking about Jesus, that he had to come, that he had to suffer, that he had to die, and that God would raise him from the dead, that that's all there, and that you can know that if you study the Word. Now, as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus but speak the words of truth and reason. Now, I find this part interesting, as some of you might guess, <laughs> because this is not the last time that Christians have heard this, right? That believes in Christ have heard this. Festus is confused, okay? So let's just get with a couple things. Festus is confused about what Paul is saying. First of all, Festus comes into this region. He's told, hey, listen, these, these Jewish folks are not happy with Rome. They, they, they talk about this Messiah figure who he's always heard of as a warrior, somebody who's going to try to, to take take Rome out. And so you've had these false sort of people who have claimed to be messiahs and so on, who have started battles and wars and, and out, you know, gathered people to themselves out in the desert and came against Rome and so on. So those, that's his mindset of what a messiah is. The idea of what Paul's talking about, that the messiah is going to suffer and die, then rise again, is nothing he's ever heard before. Not to mention that bodily resurrection, what Christ promises us, a new heaven, a new earth, a bodily resurrection is not what the Romans were looking for. They were looking to be rid of the body. And so that also would have been crazy and confusing to Festus. He just didn't get it. He didn't get it. Let's not forget that the disciples of Jesus who had walked with him all that time didn't get it either when Jesus said he was going to suffer and die. Right? So it's not so crazy that Festus didn't get it. But he didn't. He didn't get it. And he's saying, listen, you're crazy. You're crazy. And Paul says, I speak the words of truth and reason. Right? And as I said, people still object the way that Festus did. Christianity is stupid. Right? It's believing in fairy tales. It's it's believing in some Bronze Age myth. And we are way past that. Hey, we've got science now. We know that virgins don't have babies and that people don't rise from the dead. They were dumb back then. And here is Paul. Here is the Lord speaking through Paul politely and calmly. And what he's saying through Paul then and what he's saying through his church now, we speak the words of truth and reason. We speak the words of truth and reason. See, they had science too. Believe it or not, they knew that women didn't have babies when they hadn't been with men. They knew that. They actually were aware of that. That's why it was a big deal. They knew that people didn't rise from the dead. They were aware that that's not the way science worked. Okay, because science, right? People don't rise from the dead. And so it's not that they didn't know that. It's not that they didn't have science. It's not that they weren't smart. It's not that we think all of a sudden that like these things happen all the time or something. It's the amazingness of Christianity that these things did happen and that we have good evidence for them happening. Historically, that's the thing that's crazy. The thing that's crazy is that there is actually evidence that these things that science would say could never happen actually did happen around one person. 
Jesus Christ, right? That is Christianity. We're not believing in bronze, bronze Age myths. We have faith based on reason and truth, based on evidence. There are many infallible proofs that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And if not, what are we all doing here? There's a reason that we're here. We believe based on truth, based on evidence, not based on fairy tales. That's why we do series like the Skeptics Forum and Seeking Skeptics, which you guys can go to seekingskeptics.com if you've never checked out any of our work on that, where we talk through all these objections people have where they say Christians are crazy and what about this and why do bad things happen to good people and all the rest of that. We deal with those questions seriously because we are serious, as is Paul. Remember, he's not saying that, Paul, you're mad for any other reason but what? Much learning. He can see that Paul's very educated, very, very smart. And he's actually, instead of being able to say, you're just crazy, he has to say, I guess you're just so smart that you went the other way and went so smart that you got crazy. Because it was clear that Paul was well put together and very intelligent. And Paul calmly just says, no, I speak the things, these things are truth and reason, right? Then he says this, for the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner. What's he saying? This wasn't some secret that happened somewhere. This wasn't done in some corner secretly somewhere. This was, everybody knows about this. Been to Jerusalem lately? There are thousands and thousands and thousands of Christians. There are hundreds of people alive who are saying they saw Jesus alive after he was dead. Different times and different places that they're all saying, this guy who was dead, I saw alive again. Now that's a lot of evidence. That's a lot of hubbub. This wasn't something done in the corner. And that's what he's saying about Agrippa. Festus, we don't know where he came from. We don't know why he thinks it's all crazy, but he's saying, listen, listen, listen. You can think all this is crazy. This may be your first time. Slow down. Ask Agrippa. He'll tell you all about what's going on. He'll tell you all about what's going on with this, with this Christian thing, with these people who follow Christ. And he says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. So he's basically calling Agrippa to account, hey, you believe the prophets. You can go check out what I'm saying. You can see that the interpretation I'm giving to Scripture is correct, and you can see that it was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. I think what he's saying is something like, you know, do you think you can so quickly so that may be how your translation reads it. So quickly, convince me to become a Christian. What he's really doing is he's actually shutting Paul down because it's getting close. He says, Agrippa, you believe, you know, I want you to think through it. And what's probably happening is the Holy Spirit is convicting, and Agrippa is getting, like Felix was, getting scared as he realizes, yeah, I, I have seen. Now, Agrippa would have been young when Jesus rose from the dead, but certainly he's been hearing about it for many, many, many years. And it's probably not the first time he's been convicted about it. And there's probably a reason he wanted to hear from Paul. He probably knew who Paul was, I'm guessing, or at least what he stood for. And so he, now he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa you, you, almost, you almost got me. Or you think you can get me so quick? That type of thing. But he's trying to kind of put a stop to what Paul's doing. He wants to stop the train because I think that Agrippa is starting to be, starting to feel convicted, maybe starting to feel convinced. And so Paul says this. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both, might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. He's saying, listen, I'm not making any bones about what I'm saying and why I'm talking. I want you, I want that dude and that girl and those dudes, I want everybody to be just like me, to be a Christ follower, everything that I am. Sold out to Christ, except for these chains, except for being in prison all the rest of it that I am, I want for you. That's what I want for you. There's no question. That's always been Paul's deal, right? Should be ours too. When he had said these things, it could, the king stood up as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. Now, what I don't see here is an altar call and a bunch of hands going up and a bunch of people saying, I'm going to follow Jesus today. And, I, and it's interesting because I think that, you know, we struggle sometimes when we witness for what Christ has done in our lives, when we witness for the resurrection, when we talk to people about Scripture, about Jesus, about the things that he's done, about who he is, and they don't respond, I think we get kind of bummed out, you know, kind of bummed out. But here's my thing. If Paul, Paul, 
can't get these folks to turn with just one, you know, one sermon. It's possible that you won't either, necessarily, right? Here's the deal. Our job is to proclaim the gospel. Our job is to stand on the wall and blow the horn. Wake up! Wake up out of your darkness. Recognize who Jesus is. If they go, I don't go back to sleep. That's on them. That's between them and God. See, it's not your job to actually draw them. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It's your job to speak. Paul knew that. What do you want? I want that you'll be just like me, except for these chains, that you would know Jesus. What happened? They all got up and walked out. They didn't say, okay, tell us how to be saved. And they all got saved, and the whole Roman Empire got saved that day, and there was a big potluck. It wasn't like that. That's not what happened. They walked away. Paul doesn't know. Now, were there seeds planted? Certainly. Did some of these people maybe come to know Jesus later? Very possibly. In fact, some of these people may be the people that Luke talked to when he wrote this. Uh, We're also there. We don't know. But they didn't come that day. And so here's what I would say. You are called, like Paul is called here, to speak the truth, to witness for Jesus Christ. You cannot expect that every experience is going to be one of miraculous of people just coming to know the Lord. That's a process. And if it does happen, it's Jesus. And if it doesn't happen, it's also on Jesus. Your job is to do your job. And Paul knows that well. And I think this is a good example of it, where these people leave. I don't think Paul went, oh, I'm so bad at this. I wish I didn't. Yeah, I don't think he did that at all. I think he was like, hey, I was faithful to my part. Now, God, you do your part. All right. So they leave. They walk away. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, This man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So he says, Agrippa and Festus and probably Bernice and maybe some of the men that were there, um, the other people, they're like, Why is this guy in jail? He hasn't done anything. He hasn't done anything wrong. He's clearly just got a view of Scripture and so on that's different than these guys. This is nothing. This is not even a case. And then Agrippa says, yeah, if he hadn't appealed to Caesar, he could have gone. Now, that's not necessarily what Paul wanted or what God wanted. He obviously wanted them to get to Rome. This is the way he wanted them to get to Rome. So he wasn't going to be released. But you recognize that everybody, even the Romans, even Agrippa, so on, they all realized that Paul hadn't done anything. He hadn't done anything. So, what do we need to take from this? I mean, this is not that dissimilar from what we've seen Paul do already. And so you might ask yourself, why in the book of Acts do we see so, stories that are so similar? And here's the first answer, because it's what happened. Right, it's a history, okay? Acts is about facts. It's not put together just to be perfectly excited and have everything be new. It's a history. This is what actually happened. Paul was before Felix, then Paul was before Festus, then Paul was before Festus and Agrippa. That's what happened, so that's what's there. Because Acts is about facts, okay? But, but there's other reasons for it. There's other reasons for it. You know, what, what is going on here? What is Paul talking about? What is he trying to show these people as he's talking to them? Let's look at, uh, at verse 18. It says, To open their eyes, this is Jesus talking to Paul, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. There is so much happening right there. Jesus' mission to Paul, what Jesus is going to do through Paul, he's going to open people's eyes. He's going to turn them from darkness to light. He wants them to receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by Jesus. Sanctified, made clean, perfect made perfectly clean by Jesus, an inheritance with them. That's an amazing thing. Jesus was talking about bringing the kingdom of God. Now, if you get a chance, there's a book by a guy named Russell Moore. It's called Engaging the Culture Without Losing the Gospel. Um, It's in chapter three of that book. There's a lot of stuff about the kingdom of God. I found it to be really, really strong teaching. So if you want to read this, yes, Lori and... Glenn and whoever else. It is an audiobook also. Um, that's, I like audiobooks also myself. I like to listen to books because I'm lazy, okay? Um, no, I, I just, that's the way I like to listen to books sometimes. But anyway, it's a great book. Chapter three is on the kingdom of God. Um, I got some of what we're going to talk about here from there, and I thought it was just really, really good. And so um, here's the thing. As believers, we need to understand what the kingdom of God is because you cannot understand who you are and what you're doing and where you're going without understanding that. 
But one of the problems is that we live in a democratic republic, or we're supposed to anyway, and that is nothing like your classic kingdom. So when we think about like kings and queens, we're thinking about, I don't know, like uh, royal weddings at two in the morning that people stay up for and get all excited about, right? Or whatever. I don't know. I don't watch them. I, I really don't, I swear. Um, I, I, that's, that's what we're thinking about, right? Like these other countries and like these people who like cut ribbons or like wave to people or whatever. That's, that's what we're thinking about kings and queens, but that's not what we're talking about here, okay? Um, we need to understand kingdoms in a different way. Jesus tells us this. Matthew 6, he says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And when Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, he says this, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father <coughs> in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is talking about the kingdom. So what is this about? What is the kingdom of God? What is this about going from the power of Satan to the power of God? What is this about forgiveness? What is this about light and darkness? What, what's going on in this, in this thing? Listen, if you're a Christ follower, you've got you to connect with this about the future glory of God's kingdom. We all understand that part. We've read to the end of the book, hopefully, and you've seen about the new heaven and the new earth and Jesus making all things new, that future glory, but there's a present reality of the kingdom of God that you need to grasp onto and understand. Okay. Throughout the Old Testament, we see Jesus and the coming kingdom foreshadowed through the tabernacle and the temple, the year of Jubilee and these other things. We see Jesus foreshadowed. We see the kingdom of God foreshadowed. We begin to understand that something is creating a new order, that there's a new order being promised through these people, these Israelites, right? And we start to get that there's something there, but, but we don't really connect that to like heaven and all that, because I think that when we think about heaven, um, most people are thinking about something kind of boring. Like we're all going to be sort of like these chubby little people with like little wings and a harp. York peppermint patties, I think, are free, um, where there's clouds involved, that type of thing. Or else we're like in a big group and we're just singing all the time, just singing, 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 or whatever. And I think people, I think people connect to heaven that way. And it's kind of like, well, probably just stay here for a while, all right? They're not, they're not necessarily wanting to go to that, but that's of course not at all what heaven is about. It's not the picture that Scripture gives us. The hope of the kingdom of God is is laid out in a number of things, and all of them have to do with pushing back the curse. Right? The hope of the kingdom of God is about the blind seen and prisoners being set free and hope for the poor. Right? And, and that the old and the broken will be made new. Those are the, that's the kind of imagery that we have of the kingdom of God. And, but people got mad when Jesus talked about that hope, when Jesus talked about the kingdom. Why did they get mad when he proclaimed the kingdom? Let me give you an idea of why they might have gotten mad. Because it seems untrue. If you look at the world around you, does it look like the kingdom of God? Do the blind see? Are the peacemakers blessed? Are the meek inheriting the earth? Are those who mourn comforted? Are the captives liberated? Not usually, right? In fact, for us, as we walk around, if we live long enough before the Lord comes back, guess what's going to happen to all of you? This world is going to kill you. For those of you 40, just because that's how old I am, and over, you probably feel it already. It doesn't feel like the kingdom of God. It feels like back pain right? It doesn't smell like the kingdom of God. It smells like Bengay or whatever that you're, you know, whatever that stuff is, it smells funny. That's what we see. We see the brokenness. We see the brokenness and, and, and it doesn't look anything like the kingdom of God. It doesn't seem like good news. And some people say, hey, this is just humanity. This is just normal humanity, regular normal people and what they deal with. Let me tell you something so that you understand something. You have never met a normal person. You have never met normal, regular humanity, unless you were in the garden that I don't know about. None of us are exactly as God had wanted us to be. None of us humans are what God had wanted us to be. This world, we couldn't be in this world who God had wanted us to be, who God had made us and designed us to be. A normal human is something we don't know anything about. Because there's another power, another kingdom that's at work in the world. Satan has his own power. 
and he's doing his own thing in this world. And it's the power of sin and death that came into the world. All right? Adam and Eve brought that in. And ever since then, you haven't known a normal, regular person. That's why bad things happen. That's why we see racism and hate and violence and perversion and broken bodies and broken families and disease and death. All of that comes from that kingdom, that kingdom of darkness, that kingdom of curse. So that's the power of Satan. That's the fallen world. And when we sin, we broke relationship with God. We broke it. We broke relationship with each other. We broke relationship with nature. It was all broken and jacked up. And so as this whisper of this new kingdom was coming, as God chose this chosen people and used them to to say something to us about what was coming, about what he was going to do, he's proclaiming a coming kingdom. And from that nation was prophesied Christ, the Messiah, who would bring in the kingdom of God, and that is Jesus Christ. And if you look at the ministry of Jesus, and you see it in terms of bringing the kingdom, you'll you'll see something and understand something new and important. Listen, Jesus turned back every aspect of the curse in his ministry. Right out of the gate, he goes out into the desert and lives with these wild beasts and is not harmed. He silences the wind, the storms, the natural disasters from this fallen world with a word. He heals and sets back to right broken bodies, physical healing. He casts out evil ones who beg him for mercy as he shows that he has power over darkness. And he rose on the third day. Jesus was proclaiming his kingdom and he was showing us what it is like and what it's going to be like, what it's like now and what it's going to be like. He was making the crooked straight and taking people from death to life, from darkness to light. So why is the world still fallen? Why hasn't Jesus made all things new? You've got to understand something about the way the kingdom is coming. There is a place where Jesus is ruling now, where he's ruling now, and it's here in the church. Jesus is ruling in the church. The kingdom is here in the church. Within the context of this world, and there's a power of darkness, within the church, the kingdom is here. We are the light. We are what Jesus is using to show the light, to bring people from the power of Satan to the power of God. That's you and me if you're a Christ follower. His church, you are the ones that are showing those aspects, those whispers, those glimpses into the kingdom. We are his embassy. We are his ambassadors. We are being ruled by Christ and his kingdom. It's an amazing thing if you can get your mind around it. There's two acts here. This is an act. This act is where Jesus rules his church. The next act is where Jesus comes and takes over everything. But prior to that, Jesus is ruling through his church to try to draw as many people into the light and out of the darkness, out of the power of Satan, into the power of God, before he has to come and take over in a way that's not going to be as fun for people. That's going to be bad. That's, that's the coming judgment. Ephesians 1, 15 through 23 says this. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. The church is his body. It's where Christ rules. It is the colony of the coming kingdom. That's the church. You aren't going to church. Let's let's go. You guys want to go to church? You want to find a church? No. The church is Christ's kingdom. He rules. The church is not a place. It's not a set of, of, of programs. It's you and me 
ruled by Christ, following him, tearing down the strongholds of the darkness that's out there because you're the only ones on this earth right now, those of you who are in Christ who are following him, who are saved, who are forgiven, who are free in him, who are being ruled by Christ instead of the other thing. You have something to rejoice about because you're under the headship of Christ and he's molding you and he's forming you. And we're following Jesus Christ. We're modeling what the kingdom of God will look like for those who are outside trying to draw them in. This isn't some cult. There's nothing secret. In fact, the thing about Christianity that may be different than some other things is that we want the doors open. We want you to shine the light. We want you to see. We want you to see what Jesus is doing in our lives. We want people on the outside to see in. There's no secrets here. It's about light and darkness. Jesus is showing us what the kingdom has looked like through the preaching of the word, through baptism, through communion. We see, we get a glimpse in who Jesus is and who his kingdom is. We are being shaped and formed and prepared to rule in the coming kingdom. We are being shaped now in the life of the church. David, the king, dodged spears right, from Saul and from Philistines and the rest of that, as God was preparing him to rule. You will go through difficult things, not because God doesn't love you, but because he's preparing you to rule. You are joint heirs with him. Do you understand who you are? Do you not know that we will judge angels? Do you understand what God is doing through you? Because if you do, it helps put in perspective those difficult things that you walk through. Because you're being prepared for the kingdom that is to come. And how do we learn to rule? By washing feet, by changing diapers and cleaning toilets, by counseling each other and loving one another, by mourning with those who mourn and rejoicing with those who rejoice, by setting up chairs on Sunday morning and playing guitars and keyboards and singing in front of people, by studying the word of God, by speaking the truth in love, by playing laser tag with the youth or bunko with the retired group, by going to Honduras, by giving our first fruits to him. And we understand this and we see ourselves through the vision of God's coming kingdom and that kingdom that he's working in us now. It changes everything. C.S. Lewis says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. And this is a classic kind of Facebook C.S. Lewis quote. But when you understand the kingdom of God, it's like that. Not only do you see it when you start to look for it and you start to understand what the truth is, but by it, you start to see everything else. You start to understand what you're here for. Whether you're herding goats or you're a medical doctor or you're a plumber or, or, you're, or you're at home raising these children, whatever it is, it's for you, for his kingdom. Right now, it's important. It's not nothing. It's eternal. It's valuable. It's amazing. When we understand what Jesus is doing through us, man, do we understand our mission. We don't just go to church. We don't just find a church. We are his church. We are his kingdom. And it's the only place, folks, it's the only place where people from the outside can look in and see anything like the darkness being pushed back. As I watch, as I've seen some of these that got baptized today, some of these that I've been in relationship with for years now here at Acts Church, and I see the darkness being pushed back. I see people growing more and more and more towards Jesus, him doing more and more, preparing them more and more. I see the power of God at work. And when I look out in the world, that's not what I see. I see more school shootings. I see more darkness. I see more death. I see, I see people becoming more jaded, more difficult. But in the church, I see growth. I see healing. I see Lyle Gadda not having cancer anymore. Right? I see amazing things happening as God pushes back the curse and shows the outside what it's like to be part of the kingdom of God. Why? Are Willie and I singing at the top of our lungs in this car on the way to law school, just blasting it out, come on, Lord. I didn't sing like that. But I, it was, I do remember the song was a little high for me. Um, <clears throat> why are we doing that? Because we're experiencing something, the kingdom of God. 
The kingdom of God, we're experiencing. This is what it feels like. In this moment, I understand what it was like, just slightly, what it was like to be in Eden. What it's going to be like when God restores and makes all things new. There's just this moment of it as the Holy Spirit and I are communing as I'm singing to him that I'm just, I'm just seeing a glimpse of what it is. And the only people who can see that glimpse are those who are under the rule and authority of Jesus Christ. And the only people who are under the rule and authority of Jesus Christ are his church, his kingdom. You've been rescued by the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ, and you've tasted, you've just tasted a new creation. And because there's one thing that can't be said about you, that can be said about everyone on earth, and has, and has been able to be said about you before, you can't be accused. You know why? Because Jesus couldn't be accused. Because Satan had no part in Jesus. He could not come and look at Jesus and accuse him because there was no sin in him. There was no sin in him, but there wasn't you, there wasn't me. So what happened? Jesus took his righteousness and gave it to us so that Satan could no longer look at us and accuse us and say, mine. That one's mine. You've moved from that, if you're a Christ follower, into the kingdom of God where Jesus says, no, mine. And he says, no, no, they did. And he says, no, no, I paid. It's been paid. <sighs> Listen, that's why we're here. That's why I heard, do you know how amazing it is to know that we are Christ's? Why are these people going in this water? It's cold. Because they want to symbolize this obedience to Christ. I'm in him. Satan can't say mine anymore. Jesus now says mine and mine forever. And you can never take them from my hand. And I'll hear no accusation against them because I've paid already. And there's life forever in that. Yeah. cannot be accused. Isaiah 54, 17 says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper and every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. You're a Christ follower, which means you have nothing to fear. You are part of the kingdom of God. You're his workmanship. You're his bride. If you're his bride, think about what the best husband ever in the universe would be like towards his bride. That's what you're like in Christ. The next time you're afraid, worried, concerned, I'm his bride. Jesus has more. If you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, if you believe that he's God and has that kind of power, you need have no fear when you're in his kingdom. I'm not saying nothing bad will ever happen to you. Paul said, I'm still standing here, but as you know, who, who, if you've been through Acts, he wasn't standing there easily. People threw rocks at him, beat him down, all kinds of stuff, but he was still standing and growing. I'm not saying nothing bad is going to happen to you. I'm saying that all things will work together for good for those who, are, who love God and who are the called according to his purpose. That's you if you're in Christ, if you're in his kingdom. And so listen, don't be tied to the kingdom of this world, which is passing away. Don't be influenced by the kingdom of this world, which is passing away. Don't lust after it. Don't envy after it. Don't look at those who are in the power of Satan and say, that looks good to me because you have no idea what they're going through. Instead, push deeper and deeper and deeper into the kingdom of God, into his rule and reign. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. Live in the knowledge of the kingdom of God and do not fear. We have reason to rejoice. Let's pray. Well, thanks for listening to our sermon. Again, this has been a sermon from Axe Church in Camas, Washington. We hope you enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. If you did, you can subscribe to our channel as well as liking and commenting. We love to hear how these sermons are impacting you. You can also take a look at our podcast series that we have out. And we'll catch you again next week. <laughs>